It's kind of hard to talk about this kind of Jesus who uh, he, he shows up for, you know, to have dinner. And it's like all they can, it seems like all they can notice is that he didn't do the washing ritual before he sat down. And I bet you, can, like me, can kind of identify with that. Have you, ever, have you ever had that experience where you just recognized it really didn't matter what you said? People were going to kind of just focus on one thing. Where the message of whatever it was that you seemed to feel strongly about or that you wanted to share was somehow already kind of pushed aside by the scene of the moment. And I think... It's interesting how Jesus responds to that, you know, in in the story that Marianne read for us. He responds to the, uh, you know, the people, the lawyers and the Pharisees there with these very shameful kind of woe to you. It's one of those woe to you passages. And you know my story about the last time I was allowed to, not, I'm just kidding, allowed to be in the big church (laughs) was... Years and years ago, I was, supposed to, uh, I was supposed to read scripture. It was back when Wayne Day was the senior pastor, and he had given the scripture. And I went to the copy room right beforehand, because it wasn't big enough. So I, I'm, I hadn't gotten into the glasses thing yet, or learning. So I was trying to blow it up, you know. So, <clears throat> and I, I got it, and I got up in, in the main church, and I read the passage. It wasn't this passage, but it was a very similar passage where it went on and on and on. Woe to you, hypocrites. I thought, I just, I guess he wants me to do this dramatically, you know. So I'm like, woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites, blah, blah, blah. And after I got done with this very long woe to you passage, he got up to preach, and he opened his Bible, and he says, well, I guess we needed to hear that, but the scripture for today is actually this one. <laughs> and I, I just had one of those moments of shame <laughs> that we all have from time to time. You know what I mean? And you know what's hard about reading scripture like this is that, you know, you, it's not like watching a video. And after thousands of years, it's really hard to tell. A lot of what gets communicated is not just the words. Of course, there's a big difference between what's happening emotionally in the scene. I mean, I don't know if it's even possible to really understand this passage without the emotional content. Because was Jesus doing it like I did it, you know, the... Woe to you. I doubt it. I doubt it. I have a feeling, at least the Jesus that I have a tendency to find as, as meaningful and, and carrying uh, soul to me, is it, is it probably was something a little bit more like, hey, shame on you. Shame on you for not noticing that it's the inside that's what's important. I mean, that's the Jesus that I would go sit and have dinner with, right? Because even though I hate it when people say stuff to me like that, shame on you for thinking that. Shame on you for not noticing that. Uh, I hate it because it happens to me all the time. Whether it's Mary Ann, who has been my assistant for 12 years, saying... Kind of shame on you for not remembering his name. Or my, my wife, Jen, saying something like, shame on you for trying to wear that shirt with those pants. <laughs> it seems to be kind of my life, you know, that I kind of have this constant shaming process around me, you know. Maybe it's just the older you get, right? But it is the path of learning. It is the path of learning. If there's anything I've learned over the last, I don't know how many years, about the psychology of learning, it's that there is no learning unless there's a moment where what I have perceived is shattered. Whether it's what I have perceived about myself or what I've perceived about the world or what I've perceived about a relationship, no new growth really happens without the breaking of what is and what has been.
No new growth can happen unless there is a certain capacity for us to experience this. It's not what I wanted. It's not the way I thought it was. It's not the experience that I was hoping for. Usually what we were hoping for is a lot less than what we end up discovering. But we tend to cling to the stuff that we know, the ideas, the images that we have. Everything is images. I've talked about that in here lots of times. We carry these abstract images around as if they're concrete things, but they're really always in flux. I have an image of Margaret. She has an image of me. The image is never the total truth. It's often full of my own projections. And what I experience of you and what you experience of me carries all kinds of other abstract images about meaning and the big picture and what we perceive about the world and expect from it. Part of what is fascinating about this passage is Jesus breaks the expectation. Now, I don't know whether he did that intentionally because he was a master teacher and just decided it's time for us to have this talk. I'm not going to wash. I'm just going to sit down to dinner. Or if more like me, he just forgot. He had other stuff on his mind, maybe, you know, and he just sat down. But if you're in a place like Jesus was, everybody's looking at you. You don't make those little things, you know. I bet you he did it on purpose. And, and that he kind of knew what was going to happen. But he was, my guess is, open to whatever was going to emerge from it. Watching to see how attached to a ritual different people were. You and I have both probably experienced, we have all probably experienced times where people or groups or um, religious experiences got so tied up in a particular practice or way that there was a sense that if you didn't do it that way, you know, you... you we, there's nothing else we can hear. There's nothing else we can experience here. You didn't pray the prayer that way. That's a part of the journey, I think. James Fowler, in his stages of faith, where he was looking at the way we all develop our own journey of faith, suggested that there are stages, you know, that there's kind of early on stages of predisposition, but eventually people kind of move into a stage of faith. It's somewhat about getting an indoctrination into the faith. Think about it like, I don't really have any real knowledge of belief or spirituality or faith, so at some point in my life, if particularly it begins to feel somewhat chaotic, I may attach to an authority figure, a, a person who seems to know what they're talking about, a person who seems to have some black and white answers that I can attach to, and I kind of go up to that and I unzip my brain and say, like, back up the truck. Beep. I'm just going to take in everything. I, I don't have any capacity for critically looking at what you're saying. I just want to have an understanding and belief in everything you say makes sense. And so they take it in. Fowler also said that at later stages of faith development, people often then need to begin to question those black and white answers that they took in, as I did in my adolescence from a lot of white-suited evangelists who... I thought were right because they were loud. But at some point in my own spiritual journey, I had to question that stuff. You pull it up by the roots, you begin to question stuff, and you begin to say, is this what I really believe or not? Notice at this point, who's the authority you're going to? You have to begin to trust your own authority at some point. At first, it's all the external authority telling you that you put all your faith in. Later stages of faith are more about turning to trust your own sense of capacity to process and listen and understand and apply. Questioning faith, as Fowler called it, doubting faith, 
In our culture, often people who move through that stage are kind of seen as backsliders or people who go to 1111. Yeah, there's a lot of you in here. A lot of you backsliders who came to a point in a religious tradition or a place where you began to question or you began to wonder and you began to look a little more deeply at your beliefs that you had been brought up with or that you had been indoctrinated to and you began to be able to test those in different ways. And, over time, just having doubt and questioning isn't enough. Fowler believed we also then moved to a place through that journey to what he called owned faith, where I move into a place of affirming what it is that I have as my own spiritual experience that is true for me now. When Sam, I'm sorry, Scott Peck kind of took Fowler's ideas and he kind of reformed them in his own thinking in a book called A Different Drum. He suggested this. He said, people at the stage of indoctrination and black and white thinking need that because they are moving out of a place of chaos in their life and they need something that feels stable. The images of their faith need to not be questioned. They want the prayers to be said the same way every time. They want to know what to expect. They want it to be black and white. And in that, he says, we attach to the form of the faith. People who move towards that experience of spirituality that is more of an owned faith, who have gone through a process of their own doubting and questioning, tend to be more attached to the essence, not so much the form. As a Native American teacher once taught me in the sweat lodge back in 1980, he said, don't get stuck in the form. It's not about how the ritual is, how it's performed. It's not about making sure that the fire and the sweat lodge are the exact right distance in proportion to the little altar and that the stones come in with just the right herbs and that the, that the sweat lodge is performed in exactly this particular way. Don't get stuck in the form. It's about the experience. It's about being open to the experience. That's what I think Jesus was trying to say. You're stuck in the form. Shame on you. And guess what? For you to move out of being stuck in the form, it's the shame in you that you'll have to embrace. It's the emotional part of our journey that tells us, oh, I need to rethink this. The more I avoid that experience, the more I cling to that which is the form, the limitations of the images that I have, and no new images can come. Nothing new can come in. The longer I cling and the more I avoid the experience of something that might trigger a sense of that deflated feeling, it's only through that that I might discover something even more miraculous than I've ever thought possible. Otherwise, we repeat the same dreams over and over again. And that would be such a shame, wouldn't it? To be given the gift of a life and to just repeat the same patterns over and over again because we didn't want to have Jesus say to us, shame on you. Wake up. Don't get stuck in the form. 